So good afternoon, good evening, everyone, for joining for this special SIAC webinar, which really focuses on two key jurisdictions in Asia, India and Japan, undeniably also the two strong economies in Asia and our natural trading partners. And we have a stellar line of speakers to focus on these discussions of trade and investment and dispute resolution. Uh, please feel free to post in your questions on the Q&A function. I'm sure everyone's mastered Zoom by now and we don't need instructions to where Q&A function is. Uh, Michelle, our Northeast Asia head, and I will be moderating this discussion. Uh, without further ado, I would now request Michelle to introduce the speakers and kick off the discussion. Michelle, over to you. Thanks, Shaitang. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, we're very excited to be here. I echo Shweta's um, sentiments. Um, we are really delighted to introduce our esteemed panelists of experts. Um, everyone is based in India, Japan, or Singapore. So joining us today, we have Mr. Ryo Kotoura, a partner at Anderson, Mori, and Tomotsune. We have Mr. Nicholas Lingard, partner at Freshfields, Brookhouse, and Derringer. Mr. Vijendra Pratap Singh, who also goes by VP, senior partner at AZB and Partners. I hope I said that well, <laughs> and I'm sorry if I didn't. Um, Mr. Ms. Uh, Taiko Suzuki, partner at Nishimura Nasahi, and Mr. Naresh Thacker, partner at Ec Economic Laws Practice. Let's get started by looking at a big picture view of trade and investment between India and Japan. Um, VP will start you off. Will help. Will start us off today. And as someone who has represented Japanese investors in India, could you start us off with just a broad overview of the lay of the land? Thank you, Michelle. And you aced my name, by the way. So <laughs> thank you. That's a start on this one. And uh, thanks everyone for joining in. I really do appreciate this time. And I'm really sorry, I may have to jump out a little earlier because I'm gonna walk the talk that I'm going to do here in a matter in court. So let me just start with this relationship. It's strategic, it's historical. And according to me, it's Jana's face because it's also India's future. And why do I say that? Traditionally, Japan and India have had very strong links. And it's not because of me being on this conference that I make these platitudes for everyone to say and hear. But I say this on the basis of what I call the four wave theory. Japanese investment in India effectively has still now been on account of four waves as such. You had the first wave, which was pre liberalization which is the 1980s. This is where you had people coming into joint ventures because that was the closed licensed Indian economy. You needed to come in, you needed to share technology. And there was at that point of time, even technology absorption clauses, which allowed your domestic joint venture partner to have a look in to your technology for the convenience of entering a market. Uh, I don't need to mention this to anyone from India, but you have two of the strongest relationships in the auto sector coming in from there. That's Suzuki and Honda. In addition to that, you had a lot of heavy engineering and specialty chemicals also coming in around the same time. This was important because the two sets of industries that I'm talking about also gave a ripple effect. It showed that there was an ancillary part to these industries and an entire ecosystem, so to say, developed around them. So that's wave one for you. Great relationships still standing, albeit with partners exiting, but the Japanese company continuing to hold a position of dominance in the Indian market. The second wave is what I would call the post-liberalization wave, which is the wave which was from the early 90s to possibly early 2000. I would call it the post.com. So just post.com. This is where India really opens up. 
India says that for the first time, you don't need a permission to think about business. You could have certain sectors that may allow for a partnership to happen. The amount of restrictive covenants and the compulsory uh, absorption of technology, say, for instance, under the joint ventures that you saw, saw in first in the first wave, do not continue to exist anymore. What they are replaced by, on the other hand, is an other hook, so to say, which was Press Note 18. Press Note 18 was a note which said that if you are an Indian joint venture partner, if you wanted to go into another area or another sector, you would necessarily need that partner's consent. Now, that's generally a lot easier said than done, especially when you are bringing technology, capital, and the aspiration to grow into the market. But a joint venture partner may or may not have the same ability to do so or the ambition or the aspiration. Unless you had a number of industries come in here as well, they don't in India. For the this was a place where you saw urban consumer class or a middle class coming about in the Indian context. And a lot of the industries that you saw coming in were consumer and IT driven. So you had the whole rush of technology with respect to televisions. Uh, I can still remember maybe none of, some of our panelists may not, or some of our uh, audience may not, but the disc man and the walkman, I don't know where you would see one now, but you definitely had one in each house. And that was courtesy Sony and the dominance and the technology lead was the face of Japan here. The third piece that I saw or the third wave is I call, what I call the focus on joint ventures and M&A in terms of actual acquisition. This is the wave, what I would call from 2005 to 2010. So it's what I would say the, the boom years, India is shining and the Lehman fallout. So I would, so I would call this a wave as well. And in this, I would see that you see India emerging as a part of BRICS. You see India making its uh, foray into the world, benefiting from the fact that it had been so latent for a while, that the spring had been so compressed that when you opened it out, the jump was higher. As a result of which the absorption, the ability for the economy to grow was stronger. It was quite attractive. And you found a lot of partners finding their, their flag on the Indian soil through either joint ventures or taking up positions. And a large part of it also had to do with the fact that some of the original first wave stories had been able to sustain themselves by this time. Suzuki had managed, albeit with a slight scuffle with the government, to consolidate its position in Maruti. Honda and the Munjals were still not fighting. And they were undoubtedly the market leaders in the market, because if you added the next competitors, they were still half the size. So these inspired people to look this way. So Japan, to be fair, was one of the few countries that looked India world, even at a time when the world was looking at China. And that I think makes Japan a trusted and a much sought after trading partner. It's also the time that you had your investment into technology through Docomo, and you had your investment into Daichi, uh, into Ranbaxi by Daichi. And I will deal with these stories on how I see the change in mindset from a Japanese party and the enforcement piece a little later. The fourth wave is what I would call the new wave, which is the organic investments the exits and the e-commerce world. What people don't realize, and this is the wave which I would say is the 2018 to 2019, uh, 2010 to the 2019 wave. This is the wave where you've seen a new economy. You've seen the middle class that had started to come about in India around the late 90s come into their own. Purchasing power grows. The use of technology is also inward, not just providing services outward. 
and you find that the Japanese investment comes in. So you see areas or what I would call new areas of investment. You see renewable energy. You see e-commerce platforms. You see online and technology-based services. You see a move away from brick and mortar to bits and bytes. And people don't realize this, but Japan has been involved in creating some of India's largest unicorns. And that is the part of the Japanese business. They do without necessarily seeking an advertisement that they do. They believe strongly in the words that they live by and they expect their partners to do similarly as well. So if they have agreed to a position, they will fulfill their end of the bargain. And that's why they're such sought after partners. It's not just the ability to deliver at the cutting edge of technology at each stage, but also the ability and the humility to live by what you have agreed to and not discard it because there is something more shiny standing right next door. And I would call the post-COVID field as wave five. The relationship with Japan and India post-COVID where the world seeks to decouple from China. It's a world which is now going to look at alternatives to investment. It's a world that is also going to look at how can I see the aspiration of China and how does it fit into my economic business? I still need a market that can consume and the ability to deliver. And for India, it's a moment of truth. We need to actually move from becoming incredible India to become incredible India, to be that partner for them. I think I've spoken enough of this. Thank you, VP. Um, that was that was really insightful to see how the nature of the relationship between India and and um, Japan have has evolved over the years, um, and particularly with some crystal ball gazing as to how things are going to continue developing um, post COVID. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, I'd like to give um, Taeko an opportunity to add some additional comments, um, especially in light of your experience in both India and Japan advising Japanese companies. Um, perhaps you could set, shed some light on um, some other perspectives, particularly the Japan perspective. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, in fact, I have not too much to add uh, to uh, VP's uh, very you know, passionate uh, summary. But just to give some uh, um, uh, sense of the size of the investment from Japan to India, I, I would like to touch upon some statistics uh, uh, issued by the embassy, uh, the J J Japan embassy. And as uh, at the end of 2019, there were about 1,400 uh, companies uh, in India, uh, which was either a Japanese company subsidiary or uh, 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 investment entity. So 1,400, uh, they have, there were 1,400 uh, presence, uh, a Japanese company's presence in India, which also uh, uh, with actually 5,000 5, branches and offices across India. Uh, this already sounds like a big number, but in fact, this is only one tenth of the number of uh, Japanese companies presence in China. So as you see, uh, you know, as, as VP uh, said, uh, India and Japan relationship has been very strong, but uh, uh, you can also say that this is just a start and beginning. Uh, I, I, you can see a big growth and big opportunity uh, coming up going forward. Thank you very much for that, Taiko. Um, my co-moderator, Shweta, had a little bit of internet difficulties. Um, so she's trying to log off and log back on. So I will hold down the fort while she's away. Um, we're gonna, if I could turn next to Naresh, um, you know, as uh, VP alluded to earlier, you know, we had big investment in India from Docomo and Daiichi. Um, but those two major companies had exited India. Have those exits had any impact on trade and investment between India and, and Japanese companies? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, 
let me again you know begin by uh, some number crunching i you know as well uh, just before uh, we decided to have this webinar i also looked into a few uh, of the numbers what is interesting uh, is to note that between the years 2000 to 2020 the fdi inflow from japan into india has been 35 billion uh, and if you were to look at the period between 2014 to 2019, this number, if you were to take an average, it is at an average of 2.7 billion USD. Now that's interesting. And I'll, I'll tell you why you know, I say that it's interesting. We are talking of two of possibly the most uh, largest of investments going out and in not so happy terms. And, you know, it, it, that's the usual thing that people would do, that if there is an unhappy picture, the focus is more on, on, on the unhappy picture. People forget the happier picture. And people forget that, you know, as against the two sad stories, there are multiple success stories uh, to look at as well. And VP actually touched upon a few of them, Maruti uh, being one. Uh, obviously, Honda is the other. We can talk about the Toyotas of the world, the Mitsubishi, the Mitsui. Uh, uh, SoftBank, which has today invested uh, in so many startups in India, and, and all of them uh, extremely successful. So yes, I won't. I I, I don't want to gloss over the two, uh, uh, you know, downfalls and to say that they did not have any effect. Yes, uh, every investment which fails has an uh, effect on a ongoing investment or something which is going to come in. But at the same time, I don't think that the two failures. Uh, uh, entirely were on account of uh, truly any policy uh, failure, uh, a big policy failure. Yes, we can certainly say that in Docomo, the RBI did step in uh, uh, to play its part, but the High Court did not, the Delhi High Court did not allow uh, RBI to play that part. And the, and, and, and the Delhi High Court uh, actually upheld the uh, award and said that if it was granted as and by way of damages, then there was no reason for RBI actually to step in and to then bring in the FEMA angle. Uh, truly, if you were to step back uh, and not look at the RBI angle, it was a dispute between uh, two shareholding uh, partners. And that can happen anywhere and that can happen in any investment. Any investment for that matter can go wrong because uh, two parties actually decide that, you know, they, they are looking in opposite direction on a certain issue. Uh, yes, a telecom market at that point in time also was facing a lot of stress. A telecom market continues to face a lot of stress uh, in this jurisdiction, but you cannot also deny the fact that that is one industry which is also given a lot of growth and it has grown. It is not as if there are certain players in the market who have grown. Now we may argue on who those players are and why and how they've uh, gotten wh where they are. But, uh, you know, that's besides uh, something of that kind. Question truly to be looked at and the answer that one is looking for is that uh, uh, do these two failures ultimately uh, sound the death knell for all, you know, Japanese investment coming into the country? My answer to that is no. And a resounding no at that, I don't think that's the truth. Uh, and if you, as I said, if you look at the numbers, the numbers actually, uh, you know, uh, give a very, very different picture and a very different story. Uh, the number has a very different story to tell. So my own sense is that um, uh, giving it a spin of the kind that, you know, one may want to give to say that Daiichi and, and Dokomo possibly is the end of the investment uh, spectrum in India would truly not be correct. Great, thanks very much for that insight. Um, that's very useful, I think, for companies to know when they're thinking about whether they might wanna be investing in India. Um, I see that Shweta is back, so I will hand the floor over to her to pick up with the next question. Thank you so much. Uh, I assume we're on the floor as planned, so I'm gonna just take it <laughs> off from there. So I think uh, moving on from you know what VP had discussed about different trade and investments that we've seen over the years, um, is a very important aspect of trade and investment. You know, we've all been talking about investment treaties between the two countries and how do investors sort of take it as a safeguard and protection, you know, for the investments that they make in another jurisdiction. So Nick, uh, I would turn to you now to sort of discuss 
the India-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, this was entered into between the two countries in 2011. You know, there has been some buzz around it, particularly after the recent um, settlement that Nissan has had with India, you know, after they raised a dispute against India under the SEPA. So what has been your sense, you know, in terms of, you know, um, how much confidence has that been able to provide to the investors? A, uh, SEPA, particularly from the dispute resolution standpoint. And thirdly, how is this whole Nissan India um, arbitration really panned out to the world, you know, in terms of, you know, they've been really closely watching this arbitration in itself. Thanks, Shweta. And, and thanks to SIAC for hosting this uh, interesting, important webinar. I wonder if I can, before coming to your specific questions, just offer a little context. Uh, India has been on the receiving end of a large number of investment treaty claims, challenging adverse government conduct uh, that has affected foreign investors. Those claims have related to, <coughs> excuse me, a whole variety of government conduct, from alleged corruption in the granting of licenses, through retrospective taxation, to, in the case of Nissan, uh, unpaid uh, incentives uh, contractually guaranteed, at least in Nissan's characterization, uh, in, in, in pursuit of its investment, uh, uh, to also, um, uh, in at least one case, uh, a challenge to delay in the Indian courts, uh, and the argument being that was a breach of an investment treaty. So foreign investors in general uh, have indeed pursued treaty claims against India, a good number of claims. Uh, I am counsel in a number of those that are pending and that historically uh, have pursued, th th they, they continue. But uh, India, like many other states, uh, has uh, reacted negatively to that wave of claims. Uh, and India, as many in the audience will know, uh, has therefore sought to terminate the overwhelming majority of its bilateral investment treaties. The great majority of them have been terminated, including uh, relevant for many foreign investors, including some Japanese investors, uh, the treaty with Mauritius, given that Mauritius was a route through which uh, a good volume of foreign investment into India was channeled for tax reasons. That treaty has been terminated. So too has the treaty with the UK and a long list of other uh, bilateral treaties between India and uh, other states. So what about the Japan Treaty? Well, it stands apart. It has not been terminated. It is, as you say, rightly, uh, part of the broader economic partnership agreement between Japan and India, a robust free trade agreement that has an investment chapter uh, providing protections for Japanese investors in India. Uh, all else being equal, therefore, Japanese investors in India, almost unlike all other foreign investors, uh, need not consider structuring their investment carefully through third party jurisdictions to enjoy treaty protection because there exists the Japan-India EPA, uh, which offers robust protections. Before I come on to say a word about those protections and, and the case to which you referred, Shreda, let me just say a word about Singapore, um, another uh, state through which much Japanese investment into India is structured. There is, of course, a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement between India and Singapore. It has not been terminated. It is one of the small number of treaties that has not been terminated, but it is frankly an odd treaty. It notably omits any guarantee of fair and equitable treatment. So the protection most frequently invoked by foreign investors against India and indeed against uh, all states is the guarantee of fair and equitable treatment. That guarantee is not made in the Singapore-India Treaty. So let me come back to Japan. That guarantee is made. Uh, India guarantees Japanese investors uh, fair and equitable treatment, uh, also promises full protection and security for Japanese investments in India, uh, observance of undertakings, that is promises made by the Indian state will be honored, not just as a matter of the law governing the instruments in which those promises are made, but also as a matter of international law, 
uh, under the EPA between India and Japan. But the treaty uh, goes so far as to guarantee access to courts for Japanese uh, investors in India and indeed for Indian investors in Japan. It also happily has a robust dispute resolution mechanism. After a six month cooling off period, access is available to unsatural arbitration for Japanese investors against India, again, also for Indian investors against Japan. And it's that mechanism that Nissan uh, availed itself of in the dispute uh, to which you referred. So what's wrong with this treaty? There is only one point I would note uh, that I think is important for Japanese investors to bear in mind. And that is that the economic partnership agreement as a whole excludes application to taxation measures. Uh, and as we all know, many of the challenges yeah. against uh, Indian government conduct in the investment treaty context have related to tax, retrospective tax, uh, other tax related measures. The Japan India EPA on its face does not apply to tax. That was one of the issues in the Nissan case, ultimately unresolved because the case, uh, as you say, was settled. Let me make one final point and I'll return to this with an example uh, later in our discussion. Our experience consistently over the past 18 months to two years has been that the Indian government engages with investors threatening investment treaty suits. Two years ago and more, that was not the case. Uh, the Japan-India treaty, like most of India's treaties, provide a six month cooling off period. Notice must be given of the intention to bring a case. Uh, and six months must elapse before the investor can begin arbitration. Typically, we would find that our notifications on behalf of our Japanese and other investor clients would go into a black hole and there simply would be no engagement from the Indian government. That positively has changed. We are now finding that the Indian government is willing to engage with investors, perhaps especially with Japanese investors for the reasons that have already been identified given the importance of the partnership. And we are having uh, not always successful, but generally productive engagement with uh, Indian authorities on behalf of Japanese and other foreign investors who have threatened arbitration under this and other treaties. I think the Nissan case is therefore a great example of that, the possibility of achieving a settlement without litigating uh, to the bitter end. Let me pause there for now. Just a quick follow-up question, Nick, to that. Um, you know, of course, there have been a lot of theories about whether treaties uh, do encourage investment, you know, and, and I'm sure there must be some discussions around SIPA as well, whether this has given more confidence to the investors. And we are closely watching what is happening between India and Japan. Do you think this would have significant impact, you know, in terms of investors considering to invest more in India? Um, you know, or the other way around, or, or it's still, uh, you know, a question that we can't answer and is something that we need to wait and watch? It's a great question. For my part, I don't think we can answer it with adequate empirical data. Um, nobody really knows. We all debate the point, uh, but there's little data to point to. What I would say from my perspective is, it is critically relevant to risk appetite of Japanese investors and pricing. And so in looking at a potential investment in Japan, excuse me, in India, the availability of the protections of this treaty, which have been used, used successfully, should be relevant to an assessment of risk and thus the price the investor is willing to pay for the asset. And to that extent, it does seem to me it is really important in encouraging further, further investment. Uh, quickly, before I turn to BP, if I can ask uh, Rio and Taiko to sort of jump in here, and uh, maybe from their own experience, you know, if you've seen any instance, you know, from 2011 to now, where Japanese investors have been considering to invest in India, whether they actually took this in account, you know, that there is a SIPA in place, um, or, or this was just, you know, on the periphery, has there been an actual incidence so far? Um, it's a very, uh, uh, sorry, uh, thank you very much for inviting me this uh, interesting discussion. So, um, as far as I know, uh, it's not so um, in a peculiar case that uh, should be uh, uh, 
emphasize in this discussion. Sorry, because I have not prepared for this uh, topic, so I have no comment on okay. that. Daiko, anything from you? Have you seen any Japanese investors sort of consider? As Nick pointed out, uh, uh, some clients do ask us whether you know, investment should be structured through Singapore or uh, directly from Japan. And I definitely do uh, I, uh, touch upon this topic that uh, you know, we have SIPA uh, between Japan and, and, and India which is quite strong, which provides, uh, you know, uh, very strong protection for Japanese. And some clients do uh, take a good note of that. Yeah, interesting. Um, turning over to you, VP, um, you've of course advised, you know, Japanese clients and also sort of closely seen disputes between Indian and Japanese parties. What has been your experience in terms of the trend you know, how the disputes have been resolved between the two parties and how the Japanese parties have sort of, you know, looked to address these, these uh, disputes with Indian parties. What has been the change and what has been the trend over the years? So I see Japanese parties now looking at figuring out how do you level the unlevel playing field by taking fights either out of the backyard of an Indian promoter or bring them to a rules-based system, which is more neutral. So arbitration is a preferred route. The question comes down to whether or not, and if so, institutional arbitration. An increasing trend that we have seen is into institutional arbitrations, where there is certainty, there is cost effectiveness, and there is what one would call an efficiency to the process. The other thing that I would say is that while everyone talks about Daichi and Dokomo as a problem, I actually call it the Cinderella moment for the Indian dispute system. The reason why I say that is you saw the color of money. You were able to recover it despite a government agency coming in and wanting to create a problem. In Daichi, you actually had the court in India come out with a judgment before the Singapore court. And in such a case, Quoting Jerry Maguire, both judgments show you the money. And that, according to me, is enforcing a contract. The other thing that I have seen is the ability to use an emergency arbitrator mechanism. And I must confess that I'm rather closely involved with a fight. So I'm just hoping that I will have my Dracarys moment for Game of Thrones fans as soon as I finish today because it will be a major, major way of taking care of what Japanese parties otherwise find, which is getting into an Indian court on an interim relief fight. If you can have an effective, efficient, and economic resolution of your interim relief through an institutional mechanism, and this is where I have to say this, I am a user of the SIAC system on what I would call a large, rather prominent dispute, and I have to say, the manner in which the system works for an EA is one model that I would strongly recommend as a trend going forward, not just to Japanese clients, but also to my Indian clients. Because if you are not fighting with another three and a half, 30 million cases in Indian courts, where you have a docket that is as clogged over as possible, this allows you one definitive advantage. The only thing that I would suggest to my Japanese clients is consider an Indian seat because you get the benefit of an EA without losing the effective enforceability of an order. But I'm going to walk that talk in about 15 minutes in court. So I'm hoping that winter is coming for a recalcitrant Indian partner. I think Shweta's stuck. Yeah, we may have lost her. Um, thank you very much for those insights. You know, I think you touched on a really important topic that I know Viro is going to talk about with us in a minute, which is interim relief um, and what that means for Japanese parties, especially if it potentially puts them into Indian courts. Um, you also touched on the idea of using India as a seat. And I know Taiko does have some comments on that as well. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing the Japan and India perspective on that. 
I I'm really sorry. I'm gonna yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to pause because I think you need to log off. I'm so Unfortunately, VP does have to leave us. Um, he's got an urgent matter to attend to. But thank you so much for joining us. Uh, your very insightful comments. Um, we hope to have you on another webinar soon. And sorry that we won't be able thank to you. keep you. And sorry to not be there till the end. It's a stellar panel. I would have really enjoyed being there. My apologies. But I'm hopefully going to walk the talk. Yes. <laughs> so not just marketing, there's yeah. after sales as well. Thank you, everyone, and all the best. All right, so so picking things up where v VP left off, um, you know, with so much investment in India, it is inevitable that disputes will arise from time to time. Ro, I know that you have represented Japanese companies facing disputes arising out of India transactions, and in your view, interim relief is one of the major areas of concern for Japanese companies. Um, this is a particularly timely topic in light of the India court decision that was recently issued in the Amazon dispute. And I understand you're gonna speak about that as well. So uh, please go ahead um, and let us know your thoughts. Okay, thank you very much. So as you rightly mentioned, uh, just three days ago, uh, February 2nd, uh, uh, 2021, uh, the Delhi High Court approved the enforcement of emergency arbitration held at uh, Singapore International Arbitration Court uh, in the case of a dispute between Amazon and the future, the Indian domestic uh, uh, multi retail companies. And I believe this uh, uh, court order by Delhi High Court could significantly affect the dispute resolution practice uh, between Japanese companies and Indian companies. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I'm representing a lot of uh, Japanese companies investing in India. And in many cases, maybe more than 80% or 90% cases, the dispute resolution method uh, in the agreement is agreed uh, as a uh, arbitration uh, at Singapore International Arbitration Court, uh, International Arbitration Court, and the price of arbitration is Singapore. There could be several reasons. So, First, I'll uh, say if we agree the arbitration seat as uh, India, then uh, it's uh, not a fair. I mean, uh, India is a party of, uh, India is a home country of Indian counterparty. So Japanese company do not prefer to have arbitration in the home country of uh, counterparty. And uh, just, uh, uh, there, there could be several uh, reasons, but uh, say for example, Singapore is a very, a pro arbitration country and uh, Singapore International Arbitration Court have a very good facility uh, for arbitration. And say Singapore is a uh, middle uh, of geographically uh, located uh, middle between uh, Japan and India. But in any case, uh, many Japanese companies and uh, agree the uh, dispute resolution method as uh, arbitration at Singapore. Nevertheless, uh, when uh, uh, Japanese companies and Indian companies unfortunately uh, fall into dispute. Uh, Indian companies are always commence its uh, process uh, in India uh, by way of interim relief. So section nine of Arbitration Act provides the uh, uh, interim relief uh, <coughs> in the case of uh, arbitration agreement. So it provides that uh, also the parties uh, agree the arbitration as a dispute resolution method, then the parties can still uh, access to uh, uh, Indian court to seek interim relief. And once the interim relief is filed by Indian counterparty, then Japanese companies have no other way but disputing in India. Because also it is called as interim, but once uh, the interim relief is granted by Indian court, it will have a ruling power until the uh, uh, main award is granted by the uh, arbitration tribunal at SIAG. So it means that uh, in order to avoid some say interim injunction or interim seizure, uh, then Japanese companies have no other choice but disputing in India to avoid the, to avoid the uh, granting of disadvantages uh, interim relief by Indian courts. And once in the, uh, Japanese companies are uh, enter into the uh, interim relief process in India, it takes so much time and so much cost. 
say, uh, even if the Indian company loses at the uh, first instance at the district court, they always, or I can say, I can say always, they usually uh, or always uh, make appeal to the high court. And the Japanese company have to uh, dispute at the level of high court. And also uh, further appeal can be made by Indian companies at the Supreme Court of India. And the whole timeline of three instances for disputing at the uh, interim relief level could sometimes take one year or maybe one and a half year. Because uh, this is uh, partly because once the Indian company gets an interim relief by the Indian court, they tend to prolong the full process in India. Because as far as, uh, you know, so long as it is not reversed by the higher court, appeal court, uh, the interim relief uh, will remain effective. And it is, and the Indian counterparty can enjoy the benefit of the interim relief. So, uh, in many cases, uh, as I, uh, in my experience, Japanese company prefer to exclude uh, applicability of Section 9 of Abitinia Act of India. Uh, until seven or eight years ago, the Supreme Court of India uh, did not allow the party to exclude the applicability of Section 9. So it was uh, considered as mandatorily applicable law. But uh, around seven or uh, sorry, six years ago, so, sorry, I have a not precise memory, but uh, six or seven years ago, the Indian Supreme Court has changed, uh, had changed uh, its uh, uh, position and they are, uh, started to allow the parties to completely exclude applicability of section nine by agreeing, by explicitly uh, agreeing in the agreement. And now uh, Japanese companies prefer to uh, completely exclude applicability of section nine in order to avoid uh, the interim relief process in India. However, uh, this uh, complete exclusion of section nine has a side effect. Japanese companies cannot initiate interim relief process in India because complete exclusion of section nine means that both parties cannot initiate interim relief. And by inserting this provision in the agreement, yes, Japanese companies can avoid interim initiation of interim relief by Indian counterparties, but Japanese companies cannot, also cannot initiate the interim relief process in India. This is a side effect of complete, complete exclusion of section nine uh, in India. And, but now, you know, I, as I mentioned just three days ago, the Indian Delhi High Court uh, approved the enforcement of emergency arbitration. And yes, it is still possible that the Indian Supreme Court may reverse this decision of Delhi High Court and deny the enforceability of uh, emergency arbitration. But assuming that uh, the uh, enforceability of emergency arbitration is maintained by Indian Supreme Court, then the Japanese company can access to emergency arbitration if they wish to get an interim relief against Indian companies. So it means that Japanese company can completely avoid the very time, time and cost consuming interim relief process in India by inserting the complete exclusion of section nine in the agreement, say share purchase agreement or joint venture agreement or some other cases. But if they wish to uh, get uh, interim relief against Indian companies, then they can uh, go to Singapore, say Singapore International Arbitration Court and ask an emergency, emergency arbitration. And then uh, with the emergency arbitration order, uh, go to say Delhi High Court or some other high court in India and ask them to enforce it. So in that case, Japanese company can enjoy both of avoidance of interim relief process in India and uh, interim relief process initiation, inter, you know, getting interim relief by way of interim uh, by way of emergency arbitration. So that could be a very uh, good aspect for uh, Japanese companies. And uh, <clears throat> yes, um, you know, the process in India is not always, but uh, so I completely agree that the 
decision or court order by Indian court is very fair and uh, sometimes favorable for our foreign companies. That's good. But the issue is that procedural issues, you know, it takes so many, it takes so much time to uh, process, to take further process in India. And sometimes Indian counterparties try to prolong the process. That's a problem. So in order to avoid this time and cost consuming process in India, a Japanese company have no other choice but to include a complete exclusion section nine. But it has a side effect, but now we can avoid that side effect. So I think this is a maybe most uh, uh, important movement uh, that we recently had uh, for the dispute, dispute resolution method uh, between the Japanese companies and the Indian, company, uh, Indian companies. Thank you, Joe. Uh, you highlighted some very important considerations, particularly from the standpoint of when you know the two parties are negotiating their dispute resolution clause, um, and and you know of course there are various factors that weigh in on both sides. You know, for example, for Section Nine, if you do exclude Section Nine, what are the benefits? If you don't, what is it that you're losing out on? And and the concern, um, you know, of course, where you feel that Indian parties tend to prolong the process and you know how uh, Japanese parties would want a quicker resolution and, and these are some of the concerns. Well, I will come to Naresh later to address these concerns but before that I'd like to ask uh, Taiko in what her experience has been different concerns uh, including if, if you know she's seen any uh, sort of difference in terms of consideration of the seat you know, whether parties have been open to India as a seat, given that there have been so many changes within the Indian arbitration system in, in the way India is projecting itself in the whole dispute resolution mechanism, or any other concerns that, that, that are specifically raised by Japanese parties when they are negotiating the contracts with Indian parties. Sure, sure. Um, in general, what I uh, tell my uh, Japanese clients about the Indian judiciary system is, one, uh, it's unfortunately, uh, Indian courts are very, very busy. So uh, the court person is very uh, time consuming and, and also very costly. It could cost uh, a lot more than uh, what you, you, you pay for Japanese court proceedings. And second, uh, Indian courts are very active. Uh, sometimes very proactive too. And uh, 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 just like uh, uh, Ryo pointed out a few, uh, few days ago, uh, I did not imagine uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, Delhi High Court would have uh, ordered, uh, 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 decided that the emergency arbitrator's order will be enforceable in India. So sometimes uh, you, know, uh, you, you can't, uh, court decision can go beyond uh, you know, ordinary uh, practice and imagination. It can be very creative too. So these are the factors I usually bear in mind when I'm dealing with you know, Japan, India, uh, contract negotiation. Um, another uh, uh, issue uh, that I uh, usually face is that uh, it's not entirely un you know, clear under Indian law as to whether two Indian domestic parties, which includes Japanese subsidiary, uh, Japanese Indian subsidiary uh, in India, uh, can uh, choose foreign seat. Uh, and uh, uh, we are still waiting for the Supreme Court to decide on this conclusively. But till then, uh, I have to take a conservative position that uh, it's not entirely advisable uh, in case uh, it's a contract between two domestic parties uh, to choose a foreign seat. So in such case, you actually, you don't have an option to, uh, to choose Singapore as a seat. In fact, you have to you know, choose somewhere in India as a, a seat of arbitration. And I, I have uh, you know, thought maybe 10 years ago that this, this was a big issue, but uh, I also see, I think Narish touched upon this earlier, but in last 10 years uh, in general, I see a great improvement in terms of you know, arbitration friendly environment in India, especially uh, in 2014, there has been a big uh, amendment to the Indian Arbitration Act. I had set certain timelines, for uh, resolving arbitration related you know, litigation proceedings. Uh, there has been uh, ups and downs in the last few years, but uh, overall uh, Indian Arbitration Act has become 
a lot more arbitration friendly uh, in these last decade. So um, in general, I think that uh, 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 even between Japanese parties and Indian parties, uh, I don't think it's uh, entirely unacceptable to choose Indian as uh, India as a seat. It also, if, if, of course, depends on the uh, situation, but I don't say now it's not entirely unacceptable. Naresh, the spotlight is on you to respond to each of these concerns that Rio and uh, yeah. Taiko have raised and to sort of give us, yeah. you know, the view of where the landscape stands, you know, if the Japanese party is really looking to resolve dispute with an Indian party. Yeah, so I must begin by saying that, you know, the Indian courts actually do stand, uh, you know, between a rock and a hard place. Uh, uh, on the one hand, you know, uh, Indian courts get to hear that, you know, they are uh, not doing enough. And then, you know, and, and Taiko, I must say that this is not something that you said alone. It's something that is said uh, time and again, that Indian courts are very creative. Now, you know, look at, look at the situation uh, in which the Indian court stands. To my mind, uh, and you're right, 2015, when all the changes in the arbitration law came about, it happened after, after two decades of, of people wanting these changes. Uh, to my mind, you know, and I have said this time and again on various panels that uh, it is not the change in law which is important, it's the implementation of, of the law which is you know, always of far more uh, and far greater importance. Uh, interpretation by court can always give you the legal uh, benefit and the legal support, but if the implementation of the law down the line and down the chain is not right, then you know things uh, truly uh, never never actually work. So uh, while yes, there was always a requirement for the law to change, and the law did change. It it possibly changed a little later than what people expected, uh, and then you know from then on, uh, as you would have seen. Uh, uh, the Indian legislature has been extremely proactive because thereafter the, you've seen further changes in the law uh, uh, as well, which have happened. And those are again, reactionary to what, what the legislature saw uh, happening in the arbitration landscape. To my mind, the arbitration landscape in the last five years, and I'm not even going back 10 years, I'm going back five years. To my mind in the last five years, the arbitration landscape in India has changed drastically it's a drastic drastic improvement i must say and uh, you know more importantly from a perspective on what rio touched upon which is the section 9 relief i must say that you know uh, the experience that i've had in at least courts in jurisdictions like mumbai uh, before the bombay high court in the delhi high court in gujarat uh, you know down south if you were to go to bangalore then uh, wholeheartedly to my mind in many, many orders and, you know, Rio spoke about Amazon uh, and the ongoing dispute between Amazon and, and uh, uh, the Bianis. But uh, beyond that, and if one was to look at the spectrum of different matters that I have dealt with, what has happened is that uh, post the change in law in 2015, where section nine itself was amended to say that, you know, there is a time limit of 90 days uh, uh, within which if you, if a party was to be granted an interim relief within 90 days and arbitration has to be started, has to be commenced. What has happened is, uh, and sorry, and I must add, there was another change which was brought about, which was a change in section 17, uh, where uh, it said that the order of uh, the arbitrator, an interim order of the arbitrator would get the same treatment as an order of the court. These two amendments have actually helped the entirety of the interim relief uh, provision. Why? And I'll, I'll tell you uh, why, you know, I'm saying that it has helped and how it has helped. See, what used to happen earlier is, and Rio is right, one would obtain an interim relief and then, you know, the matter would go on forever. Uh, and the parties would then have to suffer the consequence of an interim relief for or against them. Uh, with the change in the provisions of section 9 what these courts have started doing is that they have actually started granting you very limited interim relief so what they would say is that interim relief is granted but the parties are to form the tribunal the moment the tribunal is formed 
a application of further application can be made before the tribunal if the parties so desire and the arbitral tribunal would thereafter consider the section 17 application afresh what it means is that you do not have a interim relief which which is continuing ad nauseum so to speak that in itself is a great great relief from from where uh, you know we stand yes an emergency uh, arbitrator's award as you know what has today been held to be equivalent to section 17 by the delhi high court in the amazon uh, saga is a great sign but i must caution that that truly is again you know to to pick up on what taiko said that is the creativity of the indian uh, uh, court because if you were to pick up the statute and if you were, if you were to look at the definition of arbitrator it does not include an emergency arbitrator there were various representations made to the government to include the emergency arbitrator provision within the act but but it has not been done so and and if that is so what it truly means is that the statute actually lacks uh, a empowerment of an uh, of an award being granted by an emergency arbitrator nonetheless what the delhi high court has tried to do is to try to help the parties by giving it a, a, by giving uh, a expansive uh, meaning to the definition uh, uh, of arbitrator and included within that definition an emergency arbitrator we may like it we may not like it um, you know ultimately in the supreme court uh, one may ultimately find the supreme court saying that we will go by the letter of the law and the letter of the law is that an emergency arbitrator is not included within the definition of arbitrator you may have that kind of a situation will i truly blame uh, the supreme court i don't think so for the simple reason uh, that uh, you know that is how the statute reads on the other hand if the supreme court was to confirm the delhi high court decision it truly is a uh, you know great moment Uh, for arbitration in india and as you know it solves a lot of rios problem it solves a lot of uh, problems of all the japanese uh, parties out there so to my mind uh, the manner in which arbitration has proceeded in this country in the last 5 years we've seen a sea change i would not think that you know it's a problem to have india now uh, as a seat for uh, for having your arbitration you must choose an a, a arbitral institution a credible arbitration institution such as siac uh, and if you have something of that kind mind you the indian courts give a lot more weightage uh, to an arbitration which is actually conducted under an aegis of of an institution like siac and that is the reason you see the sort of uh, decisions which are coming out from from various courts the last uh, bit in this to my mind is that uh, you have to be very very savvy uh on a lot of things when you are choosing a seat in india within india and i'm not i'm, I'm again not you know talking about seat as seats between different jurisdictions i'm talking about jurisdictions within india it's important because there is a supreme court decision which has decided which has said that even within india different states will form different jurisdictions and in depending upon that you will come within the jurisdiction of a particular high court therefore it is important for a japanese party to be very wary of where uh, you actually seat your arbitration you may have your contract anywhere you know it could be it could be signed uh, in in let's say uh, 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 the eastern most part of the country uh, where people largely consider that the courts are not very commercially savvy though i don't agree with that position but let me assume for a moment that you are seated Uh, you have your contract signed in in orissa uh, would you uh, then you know choose orissa uh, as your seat one of the one of the different places in orissa as your seat such that you would come before the orissa high court i would then suggest that if your mindset is that no i don't think it's a commercially savvy court why don't you have why don't you choose the seat as either new delhi or or bombay choose that choose that give the exclusive jurisdiction to these courts you will find that life is far more easier and uh, and you will find far more savvier commercially savvier uh, lawyers far more commercially savvier uh, savvy judges so that is my two bit on the on the interim relief uh, very quickly the last thing that i wanted to point out is an issue that uh, that rio raised about getting an award and then you know virtually uh, uh, it's a given that that award will be challenged in the court 
I must tell you, Rio, that the, the law again in 2015, when it changed, uh, it, it has brought about uh, a, a sea change because now it is not as if that the filing of an appeal means that you have a automatic stay against uh, the award. The award is a valid award. It subsists until such time as the, as the judgment debtor does not file an application seeking injunction uh, of that award. Until, until such time, you, uh, that award will remain operational and you can actually enforce it. And when, when the judgment debtor does come in and file an application, the courts usually, uh, and I must say that 98% of the time I have found the courts, if it's a money decree, the court will say that the losing party ought to pay the money over to the winning party on certain conditions. It could be a condition of a bank guarantee, which is obvious. And I don't think that's a wrong position at all to take. And in those situations, what truly happens is that the judgment creditor has the money in his pocket. And then the matter can go uh, uh, far uh, 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 as long as possible. That should not be a cause for too much of worry for the person who's actually won. Uh, and that too hands down before the tribunal. So, so that's, that's my uh, take on, on you know, where arbitration in India today is. Um. Thanks a lot, Naresh, for that. I think that is a really good, you know, to have the complementary sort of positions um, with respect to answering some of the concerns of Indian uh, Japanese parties. Um, I have a follow-up question for both you and Ro, but before that, I just want to invite the participants to, to send us over whatever questions you might have. You can use the little Q&A box um, at the bottom. Um, but before we get into those, my follow-up question, you know, Ryo had suggested that um, in negotiating contracts, Indian and Japanese parties try to exclude Section 9. Um, is, that, is that feasible? Ro, in your experience, have you seen that Indian parties are willing to do this? Naresh, um, your views on that? Well, uh, no. Uh, if the Indian party has an upper hand in the negotiation, I can tell you that you know, uh, they will want the arbitration to be seated in India in the first instance, which, uh, and they will not exclude Section 9. Then obviously, no one would want to exclude Section 9 because you know, that's something that you would always want uh, as, as a weapon. Uh, and, and again, you know, um, from, I, I quite understand where Rio and his clients are coming from. Uh, but in the current scenario, as what I have explained, my own sense is that um, even Japanese parties at times would need the uh, Section 9 relief. Um, and therefore, it is not always advisable. It will depend upon case to case, uh, obviously. But to my mind, one cannot say in a, in a blanket form or manner that you know, Section 9 ought to be excluded or avoided. Uh, it, is, it is a strategic weapon in the hands of both parties, and it's, it's not just the Indian party. It's, it's uh, in, in the hands of both parties, and both should know uh, how and at what point in time to use. My own sense, as I said, is that even if you as a Japanese party are in the, uh, at the receiving end of a Section 9, uh, you can always uh, you know, tell the court that, look, let the matter go into an arbitration, let a section 17 be filed rather than, rather than this matter being argued in the courts here. And let me tell you, we've tried that on a number of occasions in a number of different courts and we've succeeded. We've had, I, I, I must say that it's been, an, I, I've been at the receiving end and I've been at the giving end and at both times, I've found that you know, the courts have said that, you know, why should I give you the sort of relief that you're claiming? And if you are claiming a relief, why don't you take it into a section 70? Why don't the parties actually uh, invoke the arbitration? Because arbitration, even otherwise, if I was to issue a notice of arbitration, within 30 days, the tribunal, uh, the other side needs to uh, nominate. And uh, immediately thereafter, the arbitral tribunal can be formed, assuming it's an ad hoc arbitration. If it's an institutional arbitration, things can move really at a quicker pace. So I personally don't think now in the given situation and in the given scenario, one should exclude section nine in its yeah. entirety. Um, great. Ro, did you want to add anything to that? Otherwise, we'll turn to Nick. Yeah. <laughs> what I can say is just a difference of the position of between Japanese lawyers and Indian lawyers. So from the perspective of the Indian lawyers, uh, they believe that section nine would be workable and uh, they trust uh, the practice in the court of India. But uh, what I can say is that many Japanese companies uh, have been disappointed uh, court practices in India, frankly speaking, because they always compare the court practices in India with the court practices in Japan. And um, 
often, uh, you know, the court practices in India often, you know, so time consuming and uh, sometimes the uh, uh, order granted by Indian court is not uh, reasonable from the Japanese uh, company's perspective. So, um, yes, I, I, I completely understand what Naresh uh, pointed out, but uh, from the, you know, viewpoint of Japanese lawyers, I um, cannot, you know, perfectly uh, agree that uh, uh, the section nine should not be uh, excluded, or uh, we should agree the, uh, you know, arbitration price in Singapore, uh, in India, not a third party, can third country. Okay. Thanks, Ryo. Um, let's let's turn things over to Nick. You know, Nick has spent a lot of time in Japan. He's worked with Japanese parties, Indian parties, Japan, India disputes. Um, now he's based in Singapore. So I think it'll be interesting to get uh, sort of in a way an uh, outside perspective, but also somebody who's been on the inside as well. So Nick, please share your views and um, any interesting war stories that you have. Thanks, Michelle, and I've enjoyed this debate, um, which I think illuminates the point uh, nicely. I thought I might just give two very quick war stories, one from the investment context, the investment arbitration context, and one from the commercial uh, arbitration context in the hopes that these two stories illuminate some of the themes that uh, we have been discussing this afternoon, this evening. Uh, the, the first uh, from the investment context, we represented a client uh, with a claim against India that had uh, problems arising from a changed Indian regulation that put limits on its ability effectively to make intra-group transfers. In other words, limits on the value of dividends that could be transferred from its Indian subsidiary uh, to, its, uh, to, to the parent. Uh, we spent a lot of time analysing that uh, Indian regulation together with Indian Council uh, and then providing international law advice of whether it triggered any of uh, the parent company's rights under the economic partnership agreement between Japan and India that we've already discussed. And our conclusion was that it may well. Uh, as I said earlier, that treaty provides uh, a guarantee of free transfers out of India uh, for Japanese investors and likewise out of Japan for Indian investors. Now, the point of this story is to illustrate something I said earlier, that in uh, making the Indian authorities alive to that international law risk, the risk of a claim under the treaty, uh, encouraged engagement, uh, encouraged very constructive discussion between the investor and the Indian government, and ultimately amendments to the regulation. That did not get our client everything it wanted, but took away the most deleterious effects of the regulation, affecting its ability to pass dividends from the Indian subsidiary to the foreign parent. Short point being the instrument we've discussed, the India-Japan uh, EPA, can be a very effective stick short of commencing an arbitration. The threatened claim uh, brought the authorities to the table now all such threatened claims in our experience go to the Prime Minister's office in India. Uh, that means they get more attention than was once the case. And that's from the investment side. Let me um, offer one very recent experience from the commercial side uh, in which uh, both Naresh and I have had uh, some involvement. It is a case in which, um, as we've heard, is increasingly the case for, for Japanese investors. Our foreign investor client was ultimately in negotiations forced to agree an Indian seat. So it did, the case was uh, arbitrated with an Indian seat. Uh, happily, our foreign client uh, prevailed uh, in the entirety of its claims in the India seated arbitration. Uh, the India public sector undertaking on the other side uh, sought to set aside that award uh, and it failed at first instance. It then appealed that decision to a high court. The high court completely re-examined the evidence, uh, made a decision afresh for itself on the basis of uh, the evidence that had been before the arbitral tribunal and that was before the high court. In other words, did what the arbitrator did, but reached a diametrically opposed conclusion, said simply the arbitrator got it wrong and therefore set aside the award a shocking result to our uh, foreign client. Uh, not only shocking substantively, but it took five years for the High Court to 
uh, reach that conclusion, setting aside the underlying award. Good news is, shortly thereafter, our client uh, appealed to the Supreme Court. Within three months, the Supreme Court has reinstated uh, the award. Now, that's a long saga. I think it goes to demonstrate the theme that we've seen here uh, of improvements, dramatic improvements uh, in the Indian court's engagement with international and indeed domestic uh, arbitration. It's not a straight line. Uh, we've frequently called it something of a roller coaster, but it's a roller coaster going in the right direction. Uh, and so that is to underscore, I think, the points that Naresh has made. Um, dramatic improvements from a foreign investor's perspective. Uh, and indeed the point that Tycho made, and, and, and I wrote down your words earlier, that it is not entirely unacceptable uh, to agree an Indian seat. And I think that's a nice characterization uh, that there are circumstances where you may agree it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend for any of my Japanese clients that it be their first choice. Uh, it, it, it will introduce some unpredictability, some risk but nor would I rec uh, recommend that they simply give it no consideration. I think the trajectory has been a sufficiently positive one that as Tycho rightly says, it's, it's not entirely unacceptable. Let me stop there, Michelle. And if I can just add to what uh, uh, Nick said, I think, you know, the case in point, and this is uh, something that um, I've always believed again, that what is lacking in the Indian jurisdiction, and I'm, I'm now talking about the jurisdiction as a whole, is, the, is consistency. See, that, is the, that to my mind is the problem. You have a Bombay High Court, which, which you know, says something. You have a Delhi High Court, which you know, closely mirrors what, what possibly the, the Bombay High Court says. But when you start moving across the country, you see different uh, you know, pictures emerging. And then you have the Supreme Court, you know, uh, where I must say uh, that, you know, the, uh, 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 there is inconsistency as well uh, in between decisions. And that is something which actually uh, uh, gives rise to so many challenges. And uh, those are the issues which truly needs to be sorted out. And I think, uh, uh, like, you know, Nick again mentioned that, you know, it's a roller coaster, it's been a roller coaster ride, but the roller coaster in the right direction. But to my mind, give it another two or three years. I think things you you will see further more development in in uh, the law, far more you know uh, consistency in how actually courts administer uh, uh, all these matters. Especially when it's an international commercial arbitrations, at least the matters will not go to the district courts; uh, they will go into the high court, and that is where actually you know people should take heart because then you are dealing with roughly twenty four courts uh, in the country, with along with you know the Supreme Court. Um, if you know you happen to come across a uh, you know offbeat high court, let's say somewhere in Sikkim, then maybe you know even two years down the line, God help you. But Supreme Court certainly will step in. So that's that's the belief I have. Great. So on that optimistic note, uh, I will just take one question from the audience because we're now running out of time. And quickly, one minute, Naresh, to respond to this. And this is something Taiko also raised. Um, of course, there have been many decisions and there's been some inconsistency, but there, there has also been a recent decision which has talked about whether two Indian parties can choose a foreign seat. And, and that's a question if you can throw, your, throw some light upon this. Yes, uh, you know, one of the most uh, hotly debated and contested issues in the Indian jurisdiction, I must say, and, uh, uh, you know, entirely to my mind, again, that this is something that the Supreme Court could have resolved uh, this issue when, you know, the, the decision from the uh, Madhya Pradesh High Court went all the way up to the Supreme Court. But uh, there was a foreign element, unfortunately, in that matter. Uh, and therefore, the Supreme Court left the issue undecided to be decided in a more opportune moment in a more opportune case. Um, uh, but if you were to, if someone was to step back in point in time and go back to the 1940 Act, uh, there was a decision of the Supreme Court even under the 1940 Act called uh, Atlas, Atlas Exports. And there the Supreme Court actually allowed two Indian parties to uh, arbitrate outside the country. And I don't see any change in position in law. If you were to ask me, if you were to ask me to look at the law, both uh, uh, the law on arbitration in India and the Contract Act, uh, which is Section 23 uh, along with 28 of the Contract Act, question uh, that one can ask oneself is that, uh, you know, is there a bar under under either of the two acts for two Indian parties to arbitrate outside India and therefore to choose 
uh, the uh, seat and the curial law, which is different? I don't think so. Uh, personally, my own belief is that if this issue was to today go to the Supreme Court, uh, we we should at least that's the belief and that's the hope that you know we will see a positive spin by the Supreme Court to it. We have a very recent uh, Gujarat High Court decision in a section nine and a, uh, and a section 34 matter where the Gujarat High Court has categorically held that two Indian parties can arbitrate uh, outside the country. But uh, again, these are High Court decisions as against the decision of the, uh, of, of the Gujarat High Court. You are looking at two decisions of the Bombay High Court, which have gone against you, then have a decision of the Delhi High Court, which is fall. So uh, uh, when, when you look at the decisions of the High Court, you have equal number of decisions uh, uh, for and against. So we will truly have to await the decision of the Supreme Court on this. What I believe it will not fly with um, either the High Court or the Supreme Court is going to be a situation where parties, two Indian parties derogate from Indian law. Namely, if two Indian parties were to choose uh, the contract act to be English contract act, that to my, and therefore the governing law of the substantive contract was to be English law or Japanese law or whatever else, I think that is something which will not fly uh, with either the High Court or the Supreme Court, because that is a situation where you are going against the mandate of Section 23 of the Contract Act, uh, because you are derogating from Indian law, uh, and that will become a problem. But when you are choosing a seat outside India, are you derogating from Indian law? I don't believe that position is the correct position, because then you also need to look at Section 28 of the, of the Arbitration Act. Uh, and when you look at Section 28 of the Arbitration Act, in fact, it supports um, a arbitration to be seated outside India. But anyway, you know, early days, uh, only time can tell whether, you know, which way the Supreme Court ultimately will look uh, on, on this particular issue. Thanks, Naresh. Um, we have bought ourselves another couple of minutes because we just want to ask one final question um, that just came in through the Q&A box. And uh, Naresh, again, this one's for you. I apologize to be giving you all the questions, but it's an India law question and you're our only <laughs> India lawyer left on the panel. Um, but the question here is, you know, if a contract refers to India as a seat, just generally India without specifying which state, um, what happens? Which, which jurisdiction is going to be the seat? Well, then, you know, then uh, you, you go back to the manner and method in which seat truly has to be decided. So take it as a, as a situation where uh, a seat in vis-a-vis -vis jurisdictions have been left ambiguous. So let's say you have a contract between uh, a party sitting in Japan uh, and India, and the seat has not been designated. Uh, uh, many times people talk about the seat as, and equate that as venue. Then in those situations, uh, you know, uh, the manner and method by which a seat would be decided, namely, you know, what is the choice of the governing law? What is the choice of the uh, curial law? Uh, close proximity uh, 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 to, the, to the jurisdiction concerned. More importantly, if there is an exclusive jurisdiction, uh, you know, given to any particular court, uh, uh, then, you know, uh, that could become one of the deciding factors. You will have to, there, there will be many, many deciding factors, basis which uh, one will have to actually decide on, on what truly is the seat. Uh, yes, this has, this has been one of the largest, uh, uh, in that sense, litigated issues in India. Uh, you know, which Indian court will have jurisdiction, whether it will be Bombay or Delhi, because, you know, there are two parties, one from Delhi, the other from Bombay. Even now, you know, uh, 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 this is something which, which comes to uh, uh, the courts uh, off and on. Very, very recently, uh, one of the uh, decisions of the Delhi High Court was that Delhi was the jurisdiction, the seat had not been decided, it was a contract between a party sitting in, in Uttar Pradesh um, uh, and Noida, you know, which is today considered, virtually considered as, as an extension of Delhi. Uh, and between, between, therefore, the High Court in Uttar Pradesh uh, and the Delhi High Court. And the Delhi High Court actually, after having given, looked at the entirety of the of the contract and having given uh, uh, a consideration to them to everything, including you know where the agreement was signed, because here there was no question of governing law being different or otherwise. There was no question of the curial law being different or otherwise. It was only basis, uh, you know, where the contract was signed, where the contract was performed, 
uh, where the section nine actually went that the Delhi High Court ultimately decided that Delhi ought to be the seat. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope you know I've I've been able to answer that question, but you'll find many many such decisions in the Indian context. Yeah, so it seems like a similar process to how you would determine uh, yes. the country seat um, if no if no country has been stated in the contract. Absolutely. Um, with that, you know, we have run out of time. So I think, um, you know, we're, we're gonna close this up and I will hand this over to Shweta to, to close us out. Thank you everyone. Thank you once again for joining on a Friday evening. Uh, thank you Taiko, Ryo, Nick, Naresh, and VP who's not here and doing walk the talk as he says that so. Uh, hope to see you all soon in person uh, and please stay safe. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you. Thank Bye. You.